Timothy. Thank you, worship team. And good morning, New Life Community Church. So good to see all of you. It's a new day, and we praise God for it. And today is the day for a new series as well. We're beginning a new sermon series today, simply called Eternity. It's a big subject, the biggest one I can think of, actually. And really, if we wanted to cover it far more extensively, it would take far more than four weeks. But we're going to fit in as much as we can in these next four weeks. And today I'm kicking it off. Let's pray. Father, thank you for planning things for us, not just today and in this life, but beyond this life, for giving us more than we could possibly imagine, more than we could wrap our heads around, expand our minds to any and enlighten our hearts so we can see more of what lies ahead and what you have for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. So a question, when is the last time that you guys made preparations to go on a big trip? When's the last time? If you haven't done it yet, maybe you're younger and you haven't been able to travel much, you will eventually. And what do I mean by a big trip? Well, that can mean a lot of different things. I guess you could say my wife and I are getting ready to go on a pretty big trip soon because as my wife Amanda is expecting, her due date is in October, but those due dates are notoriously unreliable. It could be days, it could be weeks. We're about to go on one of the biggest trips of our life, and the hospital bag is packed, so we're ready for it. But we don't even know when that trip is going to be. I'm told that one of the members of our congregation, I believe it's Joanne, is actually in the hospital today with her daughter. She made that trip. You never know when it's going to happen. Now, when you're going on a trip, right, when you're getting ready to go on a vacation, maybe you're going away, maybe you're going to be there for a few days or a few weeks, typically when we're going on a trip, we try to prepare for that. Is there anyone who knows that they're going on a big trip or you know that it's coming and you do nothing to prepare? That would not be a good idea. You don't pack your bags, you don't look at a map, you don't do a little bit of research about where you're going. That wouldn't make a lot of sense, would it? And very much like when you go on a vacation and you have to pack and prepare, when we talk about the subject of eternity, every single one of us in this room is going to embark on the greatest journey of our lives one day. And even if you think you have a lot of time to prepare for it, you actually don't know exactly when it is going to happen. Very much like myself and my wife, we need to be prepared for that trip to the hospital because we think we have time, we think we have a few weeks, according to the due date, but we don't actually know when that trip is going to happen. And for that reason, we need to be ready for it. The word eternity, it comes from the Latin word eternus, which means without beginning or end. A vast amount of time that is really outside of time. It is beyond human comprehension. And eternity is something that you're going to see today that we are actually made for. I know it seems like we are so rooted and anchored in this life that this is why we were born, to do things in this life and to have friends and experiences and relationships in this life. Well, even though that's where it starts, this life is just the beginning. It's barely the beginning. It is so brief. I'm going to try to illustrate that for you today. To start to wrap our heads around eternity, we're going to go to the book of Ecclesiastes, which was written by Solomon. You can open up to it. I'm going to have it up on the screen as well. The verse is Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 14. So Ecclesiastes 3, verse 9. Right before this section, this is the famous part of Ecclesiastes, probably the part that people know the most where Solomon says there's a time for everything and a season for every activity. And he says a time to be born, a time to die, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to do this, a time to do that. And in this section, he's saying time, 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 time. But after that, he talks about life beyond time, what it means to keep on living after this time for everything has run its course. And in verse 9, Solomon says, what do workers gain from their toil? What's the point of all the work and the struggle that we do in this life? I have seen the burden that God has laid on the human race. And this does not mean that God sets out to make our lives miserable. It means that because of the consequences of sin, after what happened in Genesis 3, 6, now there are consequences for sin. 
and this life has become heavy. There's a burden to it. It's not as easy as God had intended it and designed it to be. Verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I love that verse. It's one of the most mysterious verses in the Bible. He has set eternity in the human heart. What does it mean? I think part of what it means is that we have a desire for eternity in us. We have a desire to keep on living, to keep on going. We don't want to end. We don't want all the great things that we are experiencing to end. The same way that an engineer or a designer or a computer programmer or coder wides, wires certain codes and certain things into a, into a design. They build certain things into the blueprints. Eternity is built into our blueprints. It's part of our makeup. The same way we have a desire to eat and love and be loved and have fun and laugh, there is a desire in us for eternity. And part of, I think, where I see this in life is, have you guys ever been to a concert before? Ever go to see, like, one of your favorite bands or maybe someone you've never heard before live? And the same thing happens at the end of every concert. You know, unless it stinks and the musician's terrible and people are, like, throwing tomatoes and booing them and telling them to get off stage. But if the music is good at all and people are enjoying themselves, what happens when the band plays the last song and they're like, thank you, good night, and then the you know, lights go out and they leave the stage? People keep clapping. And they're saying, encore, encore. They want them to come out and play another song. People are having so much fun at the concert that they don't want it to end. And then the band comes out and they play another song. They play an encore, which is usually what they plan to do all along. And then people still want them to play another one. That excitement of like being at a concert, right, and not wanting it to end, that shows that there's something in us when we're experiencing a truly wonderful thing, we want it to keep going. I don't care how atheist someone is, no one is okay with the idea that you would just die and cease to exist. That your brain basically shuts off for good, like powering down a computer for the last time, and you lose all consciousness, and you cease to exist consciously. It's like you never existed. Even people who believe in that aren't okay with it. I don't think anyone has ever said, yeah, that's an extremely comforting thought. Why is it that we're not okay with that? Once again, it's because it's wired inside of us. God has set eternity inside of us. We know we're supposed to keep going. And there is sufficient evidence. I'd say most people on this planet believe that we do go somewhere when we die. There are a lot of what are called NDEs, near-death experiences. There are so many of them. Even people who aren't Christians talk about how they died on the operating table and then they went above their body and they saw their body and they saw things. Enough accounts to support that there is an afterlife. People who saw things that cannot be explained any other way than their spirit actually left their body, which shows that our spirit is more than just our body. Everyone in this room, you are a soul that has a body. One day you will leave your body, this body behind, as it is right now, and your soul will go somewhere else. I heard it described best probably by a musician who said, this skin and bones is a rental. It's like a rental car. If you've ever, like, rented a car from Enterprise and then you returned it back, you gave them the keys, one day we're going to turn in the keys for this body that we're in right now. And our soul is going to leave it. And you cannot believe everyone who says that they had this experience, whose soul left their body. I've heard a lot of accounts out there that not only contradict the Bible, but the stories themselves are contradictory. And I'm like, no, that doesn't sound right. And you've got to be careful with these accounts because think about it. If someone says that they died and then came back and then they tell you what they saw, you can't prove or disprove what they said. You can't tell them whether they're right or wrong because you don't know. Could be, might not be. You don't know. And there are people who later came out who wrote books and said, yeah, it actually didn't happen. I was lying. I did that to get attention. It's an extremely easy way to get attention. Whatever, which is something that everyone is trying to do nowadays. Just say you died, that you, you know, saw stuff that you didn't actually see, 
and then tell people that's what you saw, and no one's going to be able to prove you wrong. You can get paid money to write books. You can be a speaker at events. You can do all this stuff, and no one will ever know if you're telling the truth or not. So you cannot believe everyone who says that they know what the afterlife is like. I believe Jesus because not only did he go there and come back and perform miracles to back up that he wasn't just all talk. You know, anyone can say things, but Jesus proved what he said with his actions. And he is the one who made the heaven that we are going to go to to begin with. Like, it is his place. So what he says about it, don't believe what other people say about the afterlife. You've got to believe what Jesus says. No other account is more reputable than that. So why is it important that we talk about eternity? Well, it's because of how big it is. You see, I have this paper chart up here. Maybe some of you have wondered where I was going with this. I'll move it back a little bit. But uh, I want to make a simple illustration to help us understand how important it is that we are conscious of eternity. Because most of us, what we spend our lives thinking about is this. And I'll try to draw it big for the people in the back. Birth and then death. And what we focus on is what is known as the dash. Whenever we go to a funeral, right, we talk about that dash, what the person did with their life, as if that's all there was. You know, he was a, a loving husband, a devoted father, all that. You know, he did this, he or she did this or did that. That's what we talk about. And when I said this recently when I spoke at a, at a memorial, whenever you go to a cemetery and you look at the headstones, all you're going to see time-wise on a headstone is this. You're going to see their birthday, the date they passed, and then the dash. And I said when I spoke at this memorial that on every headstone you've ever seen, something very important is missing. And it's another line. And that other line should look like this. I'll actually just start it down here. And it really should keep going. And is, is it okay if I just draw on the walls? You know, deacons, elders, is it okay if I do that? In order for me to make a line that is realistically comparable to the dash that we are living in right now, I would just have to draw this line until I keep going outside. And probably the best way for me to illustrate this would just, just keep going up Lakeland Avenue drawing this line. And I'm just going like, to keep going. It's like I, I wouldn't stop. I would just keep going. That's how long this line is of eternity compared to the line that we are living in right now. Because I don't think I can draw on the walls and just keep drawing a line on Lakeland Avenue. I'm going to draw an arrow here. So for those of you, you know, who have seen a number line, you know, in math class, you know, you've seen like that line, you know, that indicates, you know, the, the numbers. An arrow shows that it just, it keeps going. Where is the end of the number line? There is no end. It just keeps going infinitely. So really, we wanted to correct every headstone we've ever seen. I just want to go around with a Sharpie and just like draw like a line on like every headstone that I see. Because why do we forget about this? The amount of time that we spend in this life is so short compared to the amount of time we're going to spend in the place we're going. If you ask someone, how long is 70 years? I think the average human lifespan right now is somewhere between 70 and 80 years. If you ask someone, how long is 70 years compared to what? If you're in eternity and you ask someone like Moses, hey, Mo, how long is 70 years? He'd be like, oh, are you kidding me? You mean like 70 minutes? We act like this life is so long, but it is so short. It is the shortest thing compared to eternity. And that's why we need to be thinking about it. So that's one of the first points I want to make. Eternity is big. Next point I want to make, God is bigger. How is God bigger than that? Well, it's very simple. I talked about how eternity for us keeps going in one direction. So now I'm going to draw another simple illustration. I'm just going to write. God. So God, like us, also will exist forever. I could draw the same line for him that, you know, keeps going and going and going. But unlike us, God's existence keeps going in both directions. Not only will God always 
exist. God has always existed. He has no end, and he also has no beginning. This is in the Bible where it says in Psalm 90, it says, He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is from eternity, and his existence will carry continuously into all eternity. I don't know about you, but when I try to think about this, I feel like my brain is like one of those wind-up toys. You ever see like one of those cymbal clanging like monkeys, you know, that you just wind up? I just feel like bing, bing, like a wind-up toy that's just bouncing into a wall and just like can't get around it. That's how I feel when I try to process this. How is it possible that God has no beginning? It's like everything has a beginning. Something just doesn't come out of nowhere. Like something must have created God. But when you think about it, if something created God, that means that that thing would have had to have existed before God, which means what created that thing? And this is why in philosophy there's this idea of the original uncaused cause. Everything is cause and effect, right? We exist because, you know, our parents caused us to be here, because, you know, something set our existence in motion. But there must be something that always existed that was not caused by anything. And that someone is God. So this shows how stuck in time we are. We can't wrap our heads around this. I can't fit this in my little rental vehicle. There's not enough space. I can't process it. How is it possible that something never ends? How is it possible that someone never begins? This is the mystery of eternity. And even though we can't understand it, we long for it. We long for something that we can't even understand because we know that this life is not long enough. We know that the relationships with our loved ones, the beautiful things that God has created down here, they have to continue. They need to continue. How could they not? When comforting people who have lost loved ones, someone said the most reassuring thing they ever heard was that your time with the people you miss is going to be longer than your time without them. So the time that you spend missing them is going to be way shorter than the time you spend with them again. Like I said, how long is 70 years? Well, it depends who you're talking to. If you talk to someone who's been in eternity for decades or millennia, they'd be like, oh man, you mean 70 seconds? That's not long at all. Like, you know, the time I spent missing that person, the time they spent missing me, are you kidding me? It's so short. Shortest thing I can think of. So since we are going on a very big trip, we need to start thinking about it. Let's get back to that verse in Ecclesiastes because I didn't finish it. So I left off where it says he has set eternity in the human heart. And that was in verse 11. And then in verse 12, Solomon says, I know that there is nothing better than for people to be happy and do good while they live, which again is short that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. So again, God has created things to be forever, to have a kind of permanence that does not end. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God does this so that people will fear him. And that phrase for fearing God really means respecting God. Now, as we start to think about eternity, which we're going to do throughout the rest of this series as well, I want to address some misconceptions about heaven. Like we said, if we're going somewhere, we want to know where we're going. If you're going on vacation, if you're going to Hawaii or the Caribbean or whatever, you're probably going to look it up a little bit. You're going to make sure you understand how it works and what you're going to do on your trip. The Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about heaven. It tells us enough about heaven and hell. Those, you're going to end up in one of two places. So we know what we need to know. The Bible tells us more about what we need to know in this life because this is going to be the starting point. But it does tell us quite a bit about eternity. I'm not going to steal the thunder from the other members of the preaching team that are going to talk more about afterlife and the other messages we're going to do. But the Bible does tell us to be aware of it, to think about it, to set your mind on it, which is something Tanya is going to talk about next week. And we need to be doing that properly. As Christians, we need to make sure that the Bible is our source of truth and that we're not getting ideas about afterlife from movies and TV shows and from our own imagination. 
Here are some common misconceptions about the afterlife. Number one, it's that we become angels. We do not become angels. The Bible does not say that that happens. You do not get wings. You do not become an angelic being. You do not become an angel. So that is something that is from Hollywood. That is not from the Bible. And another misconception that people in heaven, you know, people who have passed are always with you. I'm sorry to tell you, they are not. They are with God. And God is always with us. But heaven, it's pretty far away. Like I can't even tell you how far away it is, but you can get there in an instant. That's the weirdest thing about it, right, about eternity. It's so far away, so far that physically speaking, no spacecraft or anything could even get to it, but you can get there in an instant. I can't think of any other place like that. It's crazy. So the people who have passed, they are not with us. You know, we, we can't feel their presence. They are not with us. They are with God. And this is another thing that might be a little controversial, but it's not in the Bible. They do not send signs. People that have passed, they do not send you signs. They cannot communicate with you. The, often the reason people think they're seeing signs is because when someone passes, we're so desperate. We're just so hungry for some consolation that we start paying more attention to things that were actually there all along. Like people will say, oh, you know, someone passed and then I saw a butterfly. Turns out that butterfly was always there. That butterfly has been there for the past three weeks. We just saw it for the first time because we wanted to. So the idea that people communicate with us after they have passed is directly contradictory to what the Bible says. We don't know everything about eternity, like I said. The Bible doesn't give us tremendous details. For instance, the Bible doesn't say directly that animals are in heaven. Now, personally, I believe that they are going to be there. More reputable accounts of people who have passed, they said that they saw animals up there. And God does have a heart for animals. It does say in Revelation as well that in the new heaven and the new earth, that there will be animals there. So sometimes there are some things that could be true about heaven, that could be true about eternity, that do not directly contradict the Bible. But if something directly contradicts what the Bible says, if we are to call ourselves Christians, we cannot go on believing something just because it makes us happy. We need to make sure that there's actually evidence for it. Otherwise, we might just be fooling ourselves. People in heaven do know what happens on earth. And I say that because I have a Bible verse to back it up. However, when you are in heaven, you cannot interfere with what is happening on earth any longer. Let's go to a verse in Hebrews. This is Hebrews chapter 12. It's a verse that many of you may know. It's where the writer of Hebrews has just finished describing all the people in the Old Testament who passed and, and went to be with God in, in years past, you know, before Jesus came. People like Abraham, uh, Moses, Samson, the other judges who, uh, who all lived before Jesus came and it explained how these people have passed on and now they're with Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews is using the illustration of an athletic stadium. He's comparing us to runners, as you'll see, and saying that we should run this race that is set out before us. And it describes the people who went before us as being witnesses, people who are watching. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the writer says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, these are the people who have gone and died and to be with Jesus, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is known as the pioneer of our faith because a pioneer is someone who goes first, like someone who sets out on a journey and paves the way before anyone else gets there. And that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross, by making a way for us. Jesus was the first to make a way for us to be with God and let us be in his presence and experience the fullness of his presence without any guilt, without any sin, to stand sinless before the Father. Jesus was the one who made that way first. So I highlighted the part that says a great cloud of witnesses. Witnesses are people who saw something or maybe who continue to see something. You cannot be a witness if you have no idea what is going on. 
when there is a court case going on and a witness is called to the stand, the people examining them will ask, so what happened the night of the crime? What did you see? Assuming that they actually saw something. The person can't say, well, actually, uh, I had no idea what was going on. I wasn't there that night. They can't be a witness because they didn't see anything. But Hebrews describes people who have already died as witnesses. And here's one of the best analogies I can give you. How many football fans in the house? I mean, I'm not a diehard football fan, but you know, I like watching it. I watch it if it's on. But whenever you're watching a football game, it doesn't matter if you're watching it on TV or if you're at the game in the stands. Here's the question. Can you interfere with the game? Can you do anything to change the outcome of the game without getting escorted out by police? Ask people who tried streaking across the field. Didn't go too well. Ultimately, didn't change the outcome of the game. When you're watching a football game or any sports event, you cannot change the outcome of the game. You are a witness. You are watching it. It doesn't matter how much you scream and yell at your TV set. Some people yell at the TV like if they raise their voice more. It can change the game. They can't hear you. You can't change it. And even if they can hear you, they're not listening to you. The people on the field, they ain't taking your directions. For all the Monday morning quarterbacks in the room, they're not listening to you. They're listening to the coach. They're listening to the guy with the microphone, you know, the headset that you see on the field, telling them what to do. People who have died or are in heaven, they cannot interfere with the game. They cannot change the outcome. Apparently, the game is on in heaven. They're watching it, but it's almost more like Thanksgiving, right? You know, when everyone gets around and there's always a football game on, on Thanksgiving, and some people are watching it, but most people, they're enjoying the food. They're enjoying the turkey. They're enjoying the company. I think that's what the events on heaven are, are, uh, on earth are like when people are in heaven. That's the illustration that I get here in Hebrews, that people are watching the game. They're cheering us on, but do you think that's all they're doing? When they're surrounded by all these people who have died before us, Moses, uh, Abraham Lincoln, just presidents, figures from history, Martin Luther King Jr., all these amazing people. Do you think that the people who have passed are focusing on earth every single second? I don't think they are. And I heard a preacher say once, when you're in heaven, you're not dumber than you are on earth. God doesn't hide things. Even in heaven, I believe you see things like mass shootings and terrorism and death and pain and problems. You see all this, but you see it differently. God isn't hiding that stuff. Otherwise, that would make him like the Wizard of Oz. Remember in the Wizard of Oz when the wizard is like, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. If God was like hiding stuff from people in heaven, that would mean that he really wasn't in control. That would mean that things are out of control and he doesn't want people to see that. But I believe when you're in heaven, combined with realizing how short this life is, like we said, people up there are like, man, they're suffering down there, but it's only going to be a few seconds. They don't even realize how short it is. You also see in heaven what we don't see now, which is how big God is, which is how life is big and our problems are big, but eternity is bigger and God is biggest. You see that, and when you see all that, you're not worried anymore. You're like, oh, you actually had this under control the whole time. God's like, yep. And then you're like, man, what was I worried about the whole time? I think that's what happens when we get in heaven. We see and we know that God is in control. And the people who are in heaven, they see and they know what we're going through. So if you've lost a parent, a brother, a sister, a mother, a father, anyone, they know what's going on here on earth. God allows them to witness what is happening. It says in the Gospel of Luke as well that when someone comes to repentance, when someone comes to believe in Jesus, there is rejoicing in heaven. Not rejoicing when they get to heaven, rejoicing when they repent. That proves further. Again, I am not coming up with this from my imagination. From the Bible, the Bible says that people in heaven know what is going on on earth. And even though we do get signs, we do get consolation, we do get things that are more than a coincidence, signs that a loved one is with God, those signs don't come from the loved one, they come from God. 
even though our loved ones, they're not on the field, you know, moving things around. You know, when you're watching the football game, you see the coach, you know, wherever the coach is of your favorite team on the field. But the coolest thing is, even though the coach is on the field, he's also with us at the same time. Isn't that so cool? Like, no human being can do that, be in two places at once. Imagine, like, sitting on the couch, you know, watching a football game, and the coach with his headset is just sitting right next to you. But you're looking on the TV, and he's on the field at the same time. That's God. God is both in the afterlife, and he is here with us at the same time. And our loved ones are with him, and we are with him at the same time. And he is the one who sends the signs. He is the one who comforts us. He is the one who makes us feel better. And isn't he the one who knows best how to do it anyway? Can anyone who has passed give God a suggestion of how best to comfort someone? Like, hey God, you know, I really think my loved one needs this today. I think you should do this. You think God would say, wow, I never thought of that. That's pretty good. Do you think someone who's always existed needs any suggestions? Do you think he needs any ideas of how best to take care of people? Man, when I'm up there, I ain't going to be helping anyone down here. Not that I can to begin with. I'd be like, man, God, even if I had any ability to do that, I'd say, you take care of it. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I just got here and I realized that I had no idea what was going on down there. I think you know what you're doing. So the people who have passed, they're not the ones we should look to. It is the one that they are with. It is Jesus who we will go to be with. The one who made the way for us. And that's what we're going to focus on in this eternity, in this, in this message about eternity, about how to prepare for this trip, how to pack for it, how to get ready for it, so we're not afraid of it. One of my favorite lines in a song is from the, the song In Christ Alone, where it says, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. I'm not afraid to die. I don't want to leave loved ones behind, but I know that if I passed unexpectedly, he'd take care of them. He'd know they he would make sure they were taken care of. I'm not afraid to die. I'm not. And I don't want anyone in this room to have that fear either. It's scary going to a place you've never been before. You know, it is scary. It's hard to wrap your heads around. But there's no need to be afraid. And when we get there, I know exactly what I'm going to say. My ticket, you know, my hotel reservation, whatever you want to call it, it's not even something I can forget at home because it's always with me. It's knowing that Jesus is the one who paid for my place there. I'm going to get there and I'm going to say, I plead the blood of Jesus. I, I I'm deserve to be here, not because of anything I did, but because of what he did. It's not because I spoke in church. It's not because I was a good husband or a good father or a good this or a good that. It's not because I lived a good life. It's because he lived a good life. Because Jesus lived a good life. And he died an obedient death and he resurrected and he beat death. So I'm going to get there and I'm going to say, I plead the blood of Jesus and that's why you have to let me in. And I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant for how I lived and how I believed in this life. That's what we all want to hear one day. So let us set our minds on eternity. Let's talk about it. Let's think about it. Let's not try to distract ourselves from it just because death is uncomfortable. I'm excited. I'm ready. I'm excited to see what God has in this immeasurable stretch of time. But I want to see what he has to teach me in this life while I'm here. I don't want to rush it, but don't fear death. Be ready. Be ready for that trip because you never know when you're going to make it. Lord, thank you that you have made a way for us. Thank you that you've given us a map. You've helped us know what to expect so we don't have to worry about tomorrow. We don't have to worry about every tomorrow. We don't have to worry that there won't be a tomorrow because there's always tomorrow with you. There's always more time to worship you and live with you and love with you. Thank you, Lord, so much for placing eternity in our hearts and not just giving us a longing for it, a hunger and a desire for it, but for fulfilling that longing. Thank you that every desire we have to be reunited, to be whole, to be comforted, will be fulfilled and that there is more joy awaiting for us than we could possibly imagine. Thank you, Jesus, for eternal life. We love you and praise you and pray all these things in your name. Amen.